Good evening. I'm Stuart Henderson, director of Jefferson Lab. It's my privilege to welcome you to our first virtual field trip for families. Jefferson Lab is one of 17 national labs funded by the Department of Energy. It's also the home of a unique research facility, the Continuous Electron Beam Accelerator Facility, a world-leading research tool for enabling explorations of the particles and forces that form the nucleus of the atom and all matter as we know it. Tonight's event will take you deep inside CBAF, the world's first large-scale superconducting radio frequency particle accelerator, and three of CBAF's unique research halls. You'll also visit the world's largest cryogenic refrigerators and get a glimpse inside labs dedicated to pushing the frontiers of discovery through superconducting accelerator technology research and development. Our expert scientists and engineers are your personal guides, and after presenting each area, they will be on hand to take any questions you may have about Jefferson Labs research and how we carry it out. On behalf of our dedicated staff and scientific users, let me say that we're proud of the science that we accomplish here, and we're happy that you've joined us to learn more about Virginia's National Lab. Thank you for your time, and we hope you enjoy your visit. Thank you, Stuart, and welcome, everyone. I'm Lauren, your host for this live virtual tour. As we go along, please add any questions you have for our speakers in the YouTube live chat. We do have a slight delay for the live broadcast, so it would be helpful if you submitted your questions before the Q&A portion of our tours. We also have Science Steve from Frostbite Theater, as well as Pashupati from the SRF Institute and David from Experimental Halls ANC to help answer questions in the chat as we go along. Now to kick off this virtual tour, we have asked Todd, a JLab senior staff scientist, to take us underground to our continuous electron beam accelerator facility, the main particle accelerator at the heart of our research. Welcome to CBAF. Jefferson Lab is home to three unique particle accelerators. All three accelerators are based on superconducting radio frequency technology. This technology allows the accelerators to produce continuous beams of electrons that have been energized with superconducting radio frequency components. Accelerated electron beams have a wide range of potential uses, from experiments that explore the nature of matter to advanced technology R&D, and from enabling powerful tunable lasers to producing radioisotopes for medical and other studies. The centerpiece of Jefferson Lab's experimental programs is CBAF, the Continuous Electron Beam Accelerator Facility. CBAF is the world's most powerful microscope for studying the nucleus of the atom. It is also the research home to nearly 1,700 scientists from around the world. The Low Energy Recirculator Facility features a smaller accelerator that was once used to power the world's most powerful infrared free electron laser. It is now used for specialized accelerator technology development and unique research programs. The Injector Test Facility is an R&D accelerator built as a test bed for new accelerator technologies. It is also used for low energy nuclear physics experiments and detector testing. So my name is Todd Sadogata. I am an accelerator physicist here at Jefferson Lab. Here we are in the Machine Control Center for the CBAF Accelerator, the main hub, the network of activity, fundamentally the brain of how operations occur here at CBAF. Behind me, you can see a group of accelerator physicists and operators tuning up and setting up the accelerator, looking at the big screen behind me and all of the small screens behind us. Typically, this room has one main control room crew chief who is in charge of the entire operation in this room, other operators working with that crew chief, and then accelerator physicists like myself advising them and working with them to tune up the accelerator. After this, we'll go downstairs into the CBAF accelerator itself, where you'll get to see the real portions and parts of the machine, the technology that makes up our big accelerator. So we are downstairs here in the CBAF accelerator complex itself. Right next to me, this large silver device is what we call a cryo module. 
It stores liquid helium flowing through this from the world's largest helium refrigerator upstairs, cooling down that helium to two degrees above absolute zero. Inside these cavities are not just that liquid helium. What are they cooling? They're cooling RF cavities, radio frequency cavities. These are devices that are used to accelerate the electrons through this accelerator. How do they accelerate the electrons? They use electromagnetic fields and they resonate with those electromagnetic fields at 1.5 million times per second. 1.5 gigahertz, we call it. Those devices are fed through electromagnetic channels that you see here, much like your microwave at home, with power that goes into those electromagnetic bells to accelerate those particles through this complex. Those electrons are accelerated through this linear accelerator, through many of these devices, many, many times, five and a half times around the entire accelerator. So in this device, while we're running, you actually get five different beams of electrons simultaneously, all at different energies that will go out to our experiments and allow us to perform different types of experiments. The energy that they get up to is much, much higher than even the rest mass energy of the electron. You may have heard of E equals mc squared, Einstein's famous equation. Well, the mass of the electron is really, really small. Electrons are tiny. But as we put this electromagnetic energy into these electrons and accelerate them, what you find is that they actually get much, much more energy moving, this kinetic energy, this energy of motion, than they do stored within their E equals mc squared rest mass. Literally about 20,000 times the rest mass of the electron goes into the electrons going through the CBAF accelerator around and around and then eventually out to the experimental stations that you'll visit later. What we're going to do after this is we're going to see where those five different beams of electrons come together and combine into the one beam that goes through these RF cavities and gets accelerated through the complex. So we are downstairs in the CBAF accelerator near the end of one of the arcs. The arcs are the circular portion of the accelerator that bend the beam around to be re-accelerated through the RF cavities. Here you can see actually several different arcs, several different places where the beam goes through these silvery vacuum beam pipes, they are called. These are different energies of, of electrons. The electrons on the top have only gone through the RF systems and been accelerated once, while the electrons at the bottom have been accelerated through those RF cavities five different times and therefore have almost five times as much energy. These various Different energies of electrons then come back together, much like different colors of light enter a prism and get recombined into white light. Those electrons come back together and go back through the linear accelerator again, which accelerates all those different energies of electrons simultaneously. So you can see different objects here. I pointed out the silvery vacuum beam pipes because the electrons have to go through by the low vacuum, a vacuum that is close to interplanetary space, but you also see behind us magnets. These magnets are used to focus and bend the electrons around our accelerator. These smaller magnets that are red here behind me are called quadrupoles. They have four poles, two north and two south poles, and they form a magnetic field that keeps the electrons together and keeps them from spreading out too widely like a flashlight beam in the sky. And they keep our electrons confined as they go around our accelerator. But our electrons not only have to stay focused, they have to change direction as well. So behind us, those big blue magnets are dipole magnets. One north, one south pole, two poles, a dipole. Dipole magnets simply bend the electrons around the accelerator. If we assemble enough of these dipole magnets, we can bend the electrons around 180 degrees and have them come back to the entrance of one of those linear accelerators made up of RF cavities and get re-accelerated through the complex. So there are two fundamental parts to a particle accelerator. The RF cavities that you've seen produce the electric fields that accelerate the electrons up to higher and higher energy. Those are in the cryo modules cooled down to two degrees above absolute zero. However, you have to take those electrons and also keep them together and not let them spread out and steer them to where you want them to go. 
That's the job of the magnets behind us. The quadrupoles focus the beams, much like a lens would focus light. And the dipoles behind us, much like a, a prism uh, would bend light, the dipoles behind us bend the electrons around the accelerator so they can go around the loop and return to the RF to be accelerated again and again. Throughout this entire accelerator, the electrons are accelerated five times through each linear accelerator portion of the accelerator, five and actually a sixth time through one portion as well, before they go out to the experimental halls where they hit targets and image the nuclei of atoms to be used in nuclear physics experiments. This is your tour of the CBAF accelerator. Thank you for joining us for this tour of CBAF. Wow, what great information, uh, Todd. And I apologize to everyone on the YouTube Live. We are experiencing some technical issues. We're working it out now. But I hope that you'll stick with us um, as we get through these glitches, and we'll have a great uh, experience for you. Um, we are joined now by Todd Live to answer some of your questions about CBAP. We have about five minutes for each speaker, so we will get to as many of these questions as we can in the allotted time. We'll start with this question, Todd. What type of information does the big screen in the control room show? Sure, that, that big screen actually shows a ton of information. That's why it's the big screen that dominates the room. It shows us the status of all of the RF cavities in the accelerator, um, you know, many, over 100 of them. It shows us the, the beam intensity going to all of the different experiments and all of the different halls, whether the beam is on, whether the beam is off, uh, where the beam is going and certain specific locations around the accelerator. A ton of information that we take in just at, with a glance of looking at that huge screen, and it's incredibly useful in running this big particle accelerator. That's great, thank you. Um, so how far underground is the accelerator? The CBAF tunnel itself, uh, where the accelerator is, is about 25 or 30 feet underground. You can think of it as a couple of stories. It's, it's not nearly as far underground as some bigger accelerators, like the Large Hadron Collider at CERN that you may have heard of. But 25 to 30 feet underground takes a few, few sets of stairs to walk downstairs uh, when we want to work on the particle accelerator, when we want to work on CBAF. OK. What advice would you give to a student who wants to become a physicist? Uh, for students who want to become physicists, my gosh. The, I'd say there are two really good pieces of advice from my own experience. The first is to read everything you can get your hands on. I became uh, obsessed with science as a kid by reading magazines, by reading books, by reading good science writing. Uh, and there are a ton of really good science writers working in the field nowadays. So read, 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 even, even with videos and YouTube. Reading really gives you in-depth information that you can't get otherwise. The other thing I would suggest is find a good mentor, whether somebody at your school or somebody that your parents might know who can uh, uh, mentor you and maybe even open some doors and give you opportunities in the field. Because once you start engaging that way personally through a personal relationship, uh, you'll find that a lot of opportunities open up. That's great advice, Todd. Thank you. Um, how long does it take an electron to travel all the way through CBAF? So the CBAF accelerator, that, that big accelerator, is about 7 eighths of a mile around. Uh, it's about 1.3 kilometers if you work in kilometers, but 7 eighths of a mile around, almost a mile around. And the electrons go around the entire accelerator five, five and a half times. Now, you might think, you know, that's almost five miles of track that these things are going through, but they're also traveling very, very close to the speed of light. And they traverse that almost five miles of particle accelerator, not, not in a second, not in a thousandth of a second, in 25 millionths of a second. We call it 25 microseconds is how long it takes an electron to go from the start to the end uh, to the experiments. That's great, and we have one uh, chance for one more question. Um, how many magnets are in the accelerator? Gosh, that is a good question. I have not gone, walked through the accelerator and counted them myself. In each of those big arcs, we have about 30 of those bending magnets, the dipole magnets that I talked about. 
and there are 10 of those arcs. So there are about 300 of just those big bending magnets. We have many, many more quadrupoles, I'd say about five or 600 uh, in, in the accelerator itself. Um, the accelerator, those bends are dominated by magnets, and then those long straight sections are dominated by those RF cavities that give the particles the energy they need to get out to the experiments that you'll see next. Thank you so much, Todd. Next up is our newest experimental hall. Let's join Mark, a staff scientist with Hall D, on a tour of their latest experiment. Hall D is the newest of Jefferson Lab's four experimental halls and was built as part of the CBAF 12 GEV upgrade project, completed in 2017. Located on the opposite corner of the CBAF accelerator from the other three halls, Hall D is the only one that receives the highest energy electrons generated in CBAF. On entering the Hall D complex, the electrons strike a razor-thin slice of diamond, generating a beam of high-energy photons used in experiments. Scientists hope to capture signatures of particles called hybrid mesons in Hall D. These particles are made up of the same building blocks as protons and neutrons, called quarks. But they also contain an active component of the strong force, or glue, that binds the quarks tightly together. Hall D experimental data will help scientists from around the world reveal new subatomic particles, help solve the mystery of why quarks are never found alone, and shed light on the mysterious strong force that binds together every nucleus in every atom in the universe. Welcome to Hall D! Hi, my name is Mark Dalton, and we're here in Hall D, where I am a staff scientist. Behind me, you see the apparatus that we use for our experiments. We are interested in studying the strong nuclear force, which is the force that binds neutrons and protons together to form nuclei. And it's the same force that binds quarks together to form the neutrons and the protons. Now quarks are fundamental elementary particles, the only ones that feel the strong force. The way we study the strong force here in Hall D is through spectroscopy. So spectroscopy is the the act of trying to map out all of the possible arrangements of quarks that can be found in nature. And in particular, we are interested in a family of hypothetical particles called hybrid mesons. If we produce a hybrid meson in our apparatus, then it will decay almost instantaneously into a large number of daughter particles, maybe five, maybe 10. So the whole D apparatus has been designed specifically to detect many particles at the same time. In addition, we've been pushing the technological envelope to be able to take data at really high rate. And by doing that, it allows us to study very rare processes. So producing a hybrid meson is expected to be a very rare process. Now a scattering experiment like we have here is, uh, requires three important ingredients. It requires a beam, it requires a target, and it requires detectors to detect what is produced in the interaction. So why don't we go now and have a look at where our beam is produced. This is the Tagger Hall where we produce our high energy photons. We take the highest energy electrons from the accelerator and pass them through a very thin piece of diamond. We align the diamond precisely with the electron beam to produce photons with a specific energy and polarization that we need for our experiment. We then tag the photons, which is why this is called the, the tagger hall, by detecting the electrons that we used to create those photons. And that is done with this large magnet that you see to my right. Once we have produced the photons, they travel 75 meters or 250 feet downstream to the experiment. Why don't we go and have a look where the photons go now. We're here in the collimator cave where the photon beam travels through a small five millimeter hole that we call the collimator. The purpose of the collimator is to remove some of the low energy unpolarized beam so that what remains is higher energy and more polarized 
which is what we want for our experiment. Following the hole, we have some permanent dipole magnets which remove any charged particles from the beam so that they don't end up in our experiment. Why don't we go and have a look at the experiment now. Here we have the next ingredient that we need for a scattering experiment and that's our target. Our target is a 30 centimeter long cylinder of liquid hydrogen and we use hydrogen because it's composed of a proton and an electron and we want to scatter our photons off the proton because it's the simplest nuclear system and that makes it easier for us to understand the products that are produced in the scattering so that we can more easily find our hybrid mesons. When we use the target it's going to be pushed forward into the apparatus. So what you see behind me here is our superconducting solenoid magnet that is the red cylinder. It's kind of like a big MRI magnet but bigger so that an adult can almost stand up inside it. Within the magnet we have a whole bunch of detectors that we use to detect what comes out of the scattering. We have tracking detectors to detect our charged particles, we have uh, calorimeters to detect our neutral particles, and then we have um, scintillators to detect the, the time of particles when they travel through it. So in fact surrounding our target we have scintillators which measure the start time when the interaction first occurs. In front of the magnet we have some more detectors which are there to detect uh, particles that go in the far forward direction. So why don't we go have a look at those detectors now. I'm standing here on our forward carriage which is the most forward part of our experiment. Behind me you see the forward calorimeter and these are the last detectors that the particles will interact with. They are designed specifically for neutral particles. You can't see the detectors themselves because of all the cabling that's required to take the signals from the detectors to our electronics. The beam itself comes through that square hole that you see behind me. Once the signals are produced in the detectors, they travel on these cables to our electronics over here. We have more than 30,000 different detector elements in our experiment and each one has to be individually read out. So we have a lot of electronics to do that. What you see here are some cables that are bringing the signals to the electronics where the, the signals are partially analyzed and collected together. All of the electronics that you see here was custom designed at Jefferson Lab. Once the signals have been digitized, they are sent upstairs to our counting house for further analysis. Let's go and have a look at the counting house where that is done. This is the Hall D counting house where physicists control and monitor the experiment that's going on down in Hall D. When the experiment is running, there are two physicists here at all times making sure that everything is working correctly. But there is space for more people to work here when things get interesting. The signals from the experiment come upstairs and into our electronics room, which you see behind me, where they're combined and analyzed. We fully analyze a fraction of the events to make sure that things are working correctly, and all the events are saved in long-term storage so that we can later analyze them using high-performance computing facilities. So Hall D is the newest hall at Jefferson Lab. We have a photon beam and a proton target, and we're looking for hybrid mesons. I'm Mark Dalton. And thank you very much for visiting us here in Holdi. So many amazing things to see in Holdi. We now have Mark here for our live Q&A. Mark, thank you for joining us today. Let's start with this question. There was one in the live that um, they asked, it appears that there are three experimental shells. How many experiments can occur simultaneously? Well, we, <clears throat> we actually have four experimental halls and it's possible to run experiments in all four at the same time. And the accelerator does a very good job of, of doing that. They use um, radio fre frequency um, <clears throat> magnets to, to switch the beam from hall to hall. So each hall can get a little piece of beam every four nanoseconds. And that's what we get in, in hall D. And then it, four, four nanoseconds later, another hall will get a little piece of beam.
that we share. Okay, great. Um, why do you tag the photons that you produce and what does that tell you? So when, when you do um, a physics experiment with a beam, you, you really need to know the energy of the particle that's coming in. The CBEF accelerator produces um, electrons of a very well-known energy, but when we create our photons, they come out with a range of energy. But we use the uh, conservation of energy to figure out what the energy of the photon was because we can detect the electron. And, and by using the known energy of the beam and the energy of the detected electron, we infer what the energy of our photon in the photon beam was. Okay, great. This is um, a question about how did you become a physicist? Ah, well, I, I've always had an interest in sort of understanding how the world works. Um, as a child, I was very curious. And um, at school, I enjoyed mathematics and science. Um, so I, I feel like it was um, a path that I was quite likely to end up on. But I have a, a family member who is a physicist. And so he really um, encouraged me and was always telling me a lot of fascinating stories about the work that he was doing and acted as a mentor for me. And that really helped me to um, engage in physics as a career. Okay, great. Um, so why is your target shaped the way it is in Hall D? So our target is, um, it's long, 30 centimeters long and thin. And that's basically because the beam is long and thin. So we, um, we build a detector that can handle a certain amount of scattering rate. And we want to maximize as much rate as we can so that we get as much data as we can. And um, <clears throat> the amount of scattering that you get depends on how much beam you have and how much target you have. And by making a thicker or longer target, you are able to decrease the amount of beam that you have to use for the same scattering rate. And by decreasing the amount of beam that we use, the amount of photons that we use also decreases the amount of electrons that we need. And that decreases the amount of electrons that are in our tagger. And so it decreases the backgrounds that we see in our tagger. So it's um, a little experimental technique that we use to reduce backgrounds. Okay, great. And this is the last question we have time for today. Um, what types of particles do you make and detect in your experiments? So um, <clears throat> whenever you have a high energy beam and you put it into um, a target system, you will make just a huge number of particles. You basically make every possible particle that has a mass lighter than the energy that you're putting into the system. And so um, we're making the hybrid mesons, presumably, that we're looking for. And then we're also making a whole bunch of conventional mesons. And we're also making baryons. And so that gives us a lot of opportunities, actually, to look for and study various different particles, although we're focused on the hybrid mesons. Um, but we, we, for example, detected the JSI meson and done some very interesting work on, on that. Um, but by far, the, the most common particle that we produce is pions, because they are the, the lightest meson. Okay, that's all the time we have for this segment, Mark. Thank you so much. Uh, now we will move on to Hall B with Latifa, a senior staff scientist who is going to take us to class, which in this case means our CBAP Large Acceptance Spectrometer. Hall B is the smallest of Jefferson Lab's four experimental halls. It is equipped with the 12 GeV CBAF Large Acceptance Spectrometer, or Class 12 for short. Class 12 is a large system of detectors for tracking and measuring subatomic particles. As experiments begin, a target is inserted into a recessed notch in the Class 12 detector systems, so that the detectors almost completely surround the target. Electron beams enter the target and interact with the particles inside, such as nuclei, the protons and neutrons in the nucleus, or their quarks. 
particles that come flying out from collisions inside the target are measured in the Class 12 detectors, which can record several terabytes of experimental data every day. Experiments carried out in Hall B are fundamental investigations into the nature of matter, aimed at focusing and shaping our understanding of nuclear physics from the subatomic scale to the scale of the universe. Welcome to Hall B. This is one of the four experimental halls in Jefferson Lab. It is the smallest hall, but the one with the large acceptance spectrometer. My name is Latifa El Wadriri. I'm a nuclear physicist here at Jefferson Lab, and I will guide you to the tour of Hall B. But before I do that and explain to you how the experiment works, I would like to explain to you our scientific mission. What we are after is to understand how the proton and neutrons which are the basic building blocks of the nucleon, are held together by the strong force. So the distribution of this force must be in such a way that prevent the proton from decaying, which allow us and all the visible matter in the universe to exist. So as part of the 12 GV upgrade, what was here before was detector called CLASS, which stands for CBAP Large Acceptance Spectrometer. It operated from 1997 to 2012. Then it has been replaced by state-of-the-art detector, as you can see here, the class 12, keeping class in the name as large acceptance spectrometer, but also has been optimized to operate at 12 GV. Okay, so now I will describe to you the detector, how class 12 detector looked like in the model. Then I will walk you through the real detector. So uh, the beam of electrons is coming in this direction. And the class 12 is divided in two parts. The central detector here at its core is superconducting solenoid magnet. And the forward detector is at its core a toroidal magnet. Both forward detector and central detector are equipped with detection system to identify completely the tracks that are produced during the interaction. So the electron comes in, interact with the target. There is scattered electron that we detect always in the forward direction in coincidence with all the particles in the final state. So now we will look at the details of the forward detector. And at our last stop, we will look at the detail of the central detector. So what you see here is what we call the forward detector. After the interaction of the beam with the target, all the forward going particles are detected here. So the first detector that you see downstream of the target is the Cherenkov counter that is designed to separate electrons from other charged particles. And since it's detector that sits before the tracking system, it has to be as lightweight as possible. So special attention had to be done in uh, the construction of the mirror of the Cherenkov. It is followed by what drift chambers to measure the angular scattering angle and the momentum of the particles. There are three of them, region one, region two, and the region three. Region one sits before the torus magnet, region two inside the coil magnet, and the region three outside. So the combination of these three regions give us the scattering angle and the momentum of the particle. Now we know the charged particle, if they are negative or positive, and now we need to determine their particle ID. This is achieved, but what you see here, the time of light, that measures the timing of the particle uh, with precision of 60 to 120 picoseconds. It's followed by the calorimeter that measures the neutral particles, photons and neutrons, and also better determination of uh, the electron. In between the time of light and last region of the drift chambers, there are other detectors. These are low threshold Cherenkov for pion identification. And one sector for the first experiment was equipped with the ring imaging to separate different charged particle. And that is really the forward detector. Next, we will see the central detector. So what you see here is the central detector of the class 12, high energy beam, very precise, come this direction, interact with the target that will be sitting at the center of the core of the central detector, which is the superconducting solenoid. 
The superconducting solenoid is 5 Tesla. It is designed for magnetic analysis for low momentum particles. And also it is designed to shield the detector to operate at higher rates by uh, shielding it from all the electromagnetic background. The detector system in the central detector are the tracking system that you see here in the retracted position, composed of silicon detector and micromegas, surrounded by time of light system for charged particle identification, and neutron detector for neutral particle identification. So that completes the description of a class 12 detector, central and forward. The success of the construction of class 12, its commissioning, and now its operation and data analysis and extraction of physics was only possible by assembling the best team from international collaboration, team of physicists, engineers, technicians, and students. So thank you for uh, stopping by and checking our state-of-the-art detector. Thank you. Latifa, thank you for that exciting tour. I have several questions for you and we will keep going as the time allows. The first one is, you mentioned the universe at the beginning. What is the relation between the research you do and the understanding of the universe? Well, uh, thank you so much for this uh, great question. So our goal is really to understand the uh, fundamental structure of all the visible matter in the universe. And in Hall B with class detector, we do that in many ways. Uh, for example, studying the 3D imaging of the nucleon, where we detect all the particles that are produced in the final state and have what we call the nucleon tomography that enable us to get insight to the internal forces and the strong force. The other way is we, we want also to understand the transition between the phase where we have free quark and gluon non-interacting to really forming the stable proton that, and, and neutron that form all the visible matter. And we do that by studying what we call the excited state of the nucleon that occur just one microsecond after the Big Bang and they play an important role in this transition. Although we cannot really uh, recreate the, uh, the original environment of the universe, we study with a very high precision this event in, in high precision in isolation. Okay, great. Um, can you tell us what makes class 12 unique in comparison to the other experiments at Jefferson Lab and worldwide? Well, uh, class 12, as its name indicates, is CBEF large acceptance spectrometer, and 12 is to operate at 12 GeV. It was an upgrade of the existing class, CBEF large acceptance spectrometer. It has the capability to detect, as large acceptance, to detect many particles in the final state in coincidence. And this is important in particular to do the 3D imaging of the nucleon and nucleon tomography because it's important to understand and have all the information about all the kinematical dependence of the produced particles. So that's one thing, but also operating large acceptance spectrometer at high rates. We're, the processes that we are looking at are processes that are very rare. So, and we want to increase the rate of the data acquisition. So it's the only large acceptance in the world that operates at fixed targets with this high luminosity. So it's large acceptance, high luminosity, and also flexible trigger to allow also for potential discovery. Okay, great. The next question we have from the live Q&A uh, is what do the particles have to be sped up? Why do the particles have to be sped up? Well, we, you come with a very high energy electron. And in our case, we have station uh, uh, targets at rest inside the detector. And with the uh, Einstein equation, E equal mc squared. So you come with high energy electron, targets at rest, and you have to produce particles in the final state. So, and we count for all the particles in the final state for conservation, using conservation of energy and momentum. 
And of course, the particles that we detect in our detectors are the messenger of the fundamental interactions that happened at the center. Okay, great. Um, so how did you become a physicist? Oh, that's a very, very nice story, actually. It's uh, when I was uh, in high school, I took my first course in physics, and it's important to listen to your teachers, and they had a great teacher. Then that summer, I was so curious about how the world works and physics, and I bought my first physics book from the free market, and it happened to be a book by Heisenberg, one of the Nobel Prize winner, 1932, talking about duality between between wave and particles, and I was fascinated, fascinated by that. And it happened that I am doing this science today. And just to tell you, I was born in Morocco, which doing research in the United States was very, very far dream. So I'm really excited to be able to do this research. And this is really all about the passion. It's being passionate about this topic you want to study. And give it all what you have. Thank you, Latifa. And wrapping up with our last question, how do students contribute to the research you do in Hall B? Uh, uh, students contribute uh, tremendously to the research we do in Hall B at all phases of the project. From really doing small project prototyping, hands-on, to doing computing simulation, data analysis, and also uh, at uh, uh, data taking and data the analysis and also at high level analysis working with peers. So, and we have students that worked with us uh, from high school students to undergraduate students to graduate students and of course uh, postdocs. So, uh, students made tremendous contribution to the class 12 uh, construction and data analysis. Well, thank you so much, Latifa. Um, our next hall tour brings us to Brad a staff scientist in Hall C, our largest experimental hall. Welcome to Experimental Hall C at Jefferson Lab. Hall C is 150 feet in diameter and 60 feet tall. It was the first experimental hall to begin taking data at Jefferson Lab in 1995. During experiments conducted in Hall C, electron beams from CBAF enter the hall through an elevated pipe and are directed into an experimental target. A target might be any gas, liquid, or solid, which could also be polarized or cryogenically cooled. Inside the target, electrons collide with individual nuclei and the subatomic particles inside them. Two high-momentum spectrometers, or detector systems, capture and measure the particles that emerge from these collisions. Experiments conducted in Hall C typically focus on studies of the properties of the subatomic particles that build our visible universe, including atomic nuclei, protons, neutrons, and quarks. Welcome to Experimental Hall C. My name is Brad Sawatsky. I'm a physicist and a staff scientist here at Jefferson Lab. Uh, I do the bulk of my research along with a huge team of uh, other physicists, engineers, and technicians in this experimental hall and in its sister hall, Experimental Hall A. Now, this hall is the largest experimental hall on the JLab site, followed closely by Hall A. And one of the reasons for that is so that it can accommodate this huge detector package, detector device that sits behind me here. Uh, the scale of it is a little hard to tell between you and I on camera here on this tour, but I'm going to walk backwards and you can get a better feel for just how big this system is. One of these detector packages weighs on the scale of two and a half million pounds, uh, about two train locomotives stacked on top of each other, and the whole thing can pivot about our target, the, what we're trying to probe, which is off to my left, and we'll talk about that a little more in the future. But the whole, this whole system on this green carriage behind me can rotate about that target center. And we'll see some rails and the big wheels that drive that motion in the future. So the next thing that we're going to do is I'm going to go over the bread and butter experiment that we do in this hall. And we're going to start where the beam comes from the accelerator into the experimental hall, the beam line. Welcome to the beam line. This is where the electron beam comes from the accelerator. It's coming from 
that direction, but headed this direction towards the target, which is behind me. It travels inside this silver pipe that you can see off to this side. The electrons come from the accelerator uh, with so much energy pushed into them that they weigh 22,000 times more than they used to when they started out Wolverine the injector at the beginning of their journey into the hall. The reason for that is the famous Einstein's equation, E equals mc squared. So can't get that electron moving faster than the speed of light, so all of the energy that, that the accelerator pushes into that particle goes into its mass. Those particles come down here, and because they're so heavy, they can get deep inside the target to probe the kinds of things that we want to study here at Jefferson Lab. Now, in a typical experiment here, the experimentalist, myself, and our team, would ask accelerator for beam with certain properties, and they'll set their accelerator up and deliver it to the hall, but we don't trust them. So we're good experimentalists, we have to measure everything. So you'll see a whole bunch of devices along this beam line that are used to control characteristics of that electron beam. We measure along this line upstream before this beam hits the target, characteristics like how many electrons are coming in per second, that's the beam current. Um, its position, we can measure its position to within a, a fraction of a millimeter, so something on the scale of the thickness of a human hair. And that electron beam itself is already constrained so that it's like this thin thread of electrons traveling at the speed of light down the middle of this silver pipe. Inside there is hard vacuum because we don't want that electron beam striking anything. And that cross section, the area of that electron beam is again on the scale of a human hair. Very tightly controlled all the way from the injector down to the target. And we need to know that because we want to know just exactly where we are hitting our target. One of the unique things about Jefferson Lab is how well we can control the spin of the electron. Spin is a property of most fundamental particles where they behave like they're balls spinning on an axis. And that rotation axis, we can align in whatever direction we want. And it turns out that when those electrons come in and strike our target, different things will happen depending on the direction of that spin. So being able to control that spin direction when it comes in to strike our proton, our neutron, our nucleus, uh, or individual quarks inside the proton and neutron, that gives us an extra handle that we can use to better understand what's going on inside the proton and neutron, or the quarks or anything else that we're trying to study. Now, the next step, I'm going to take you on the other side of the target, uh, where we can see the target, the beam's still going to be coming towards me, but we'll be able to see the target and the two detector packages, the SHMS and the HMS spectrometers, to the right and left of me. All right. Here we are on the other side of the target. If you look straight above me, there's a vertical cylinder, quite a large diameter. What we, we place our targets inside that cylinder, and then we pump all the air out, because again, we only want to interact with the target, the, the proton target, the neutron target, the nuclear target that we're interested in studying. So that's right above me. And off on my left, you can see this expanding tube that runs all the way back to the rear of the hall, which is that direction. We refer to that as the exit beam line. So one of the frustrating things as an experimentalist is that uh, we go to all this effort, and I'm sure for the accelerator scientists as well, we go to all this effort to get this finely tuned electron beam that I was discussing earlier. But on the scale of those electrons, everything around us, the solid material that I'm made of, that the floor is made of, is mostly vacuum. So 99.9% .9 of those electrons will pass right through that target and they go all the way down this beam line down into what we refer to as the beam dump. This facility can deliver a megawatt of beam power, all tightly constrained in these precisely oriented electrons, and we're only able to use, you know, maybe one in a thousand. It's fascinating when you think about it because we use a whole slew of different types of targets. Uh, liquid targets, often liquid hydrogen, liquid helium, liquid deuterium. We use carbon targets, basically graphite. It's the same stuff that's in your pencil. It's that hard, you can't see through it, and yet 99.9% .9 of the electrons that we send at that target will pass right through and they won't see a thing. Most of the space on the scales that we are probing has got nothing in it, it's vacuum. The basic experiment that we do in this, in this hall is we've got the electrons that I discussed coming in, striking the target that we've ordered up with certain characteristics, certain energy, the spin is pointing in a certain direction, we know exactly how it's coming in and hitting the target. We've got that electron coming in, it strikes the target, and then we set one of these spectrometer devices up to measure the electron after it is scattered, after it's 
bounced off the thing we're trying to study, a proton, a neutron, a nucleus, or a quark. That electron comes in, it bounces off, one of our devices measures the properties of that electron after it's struck. We know exactly what those properties were when they came in, we measure exactly what all of those same properties were after it's bounced, and we take the difference. That tells us exactly how we have struck, how much energy, what direction, what the spin direction was, when we have hit our target. And then we ask the question, we ask our theorist friends, what should happen based on what we think is going on, what's holding the particles together inside that target, that proton, that neutron, whatever it is, what will happen when we hit it in just that way? And then we set up our other detector to measure what comes out and we determine, did that happen or not? If it did happen, great. Our mental picture, our theory of what's going on inside that target is true. We've got greater confidence that it's accurate. If it's something different, then we have to modify our theory. Now, one of the cool things about these two spectrometers that are on my right and left is they roll on the rails that you can see that I'm stepping over underneath me here. That allows us to set our system up to measure very particular circumstances. So we've got that electron coming in, for example. If it comes in and just grazes the target and comes off at a very shallow angle, then it hasn't dumped a whole lot of energy, more or less, into that target. If it comes in and bounces off at 90 degrees, well, then we've dumped a whole lot of energy into the target, and we're agitating, we're, we're taking that target apart in different ways. So both of these two spectrometers can be moved to different angles in order to help control the variables that we are subjecting that target to. A couple of other things I wanted to point out. The reason we call these devices spectrometers, off on my right, you can see a big blue hunk of steel. That's a, called a dipole magnet, it's like a fridge magnet, it's got a north and south pole. That is the workhorse of this device, and, and there's a similar one over on the SHMS on the other side. The particles will come in and they will bend inside the magnetic field we set up inside that dipole. The heavy stuff will bend less, because it's got a higher momentum. The light stuff will bend more. So we can set up the field inside that magnet to only bend particles with a certain momentum into our detector stack, which is up inside these shield huts. That is where we're going next. Welcome to the SHMS detector stack, or detector hut. It's a very heavily shielded container. The dipole that I was discussing just recently for the SHMS spectrometer is just over here. Particles come from the target, they get bent up, and if they have the right momentum, they come traveling through this stack of detectors that we call a detector stack, and we can identify what kind of particle it is, where, where it is coming through the stack, uh, how much energy it has, and all of the other characteristics of that particle that we're interested in. We have devices called Cherenkov detectors here, here, and back behind me. Those help us figure out whether that particle is an electron, a proton, a pion, or other classes of particles. Right here, we have what are called tracking detectors, wire chambers in this case, kind of like the bug screen in your window. There are grids of wires that are with wires horizontally, wires vertically. When a particle passes by them, I get a signal from this guy, a signal from this guy. I know where they intersect in space. So that gives me an XY point. I've got one set here, one set here, so I can connect the dots. That gives me an idea of exactly where that particle is going. The precision on those measurements is, again, about the scale of a human hair. Lastly, back behind me, I've got a calorimeter. Calorie, same calorie, like the calorie, number of calories in food. It measures the total kinetic energy of that particle the particle will stop in the final detector back there. And that's where the story ends. So we've got the electron comes in, strikes our target, we measure the electron that comes out, we know exactly how we've hit our target, we see what comes into the other spectrometer, and if it matches what we think should happen, great, we understand it. If it doesn't, we have learned something and we change our theory to match our expectations. Thank you very much for coming on this tour of Hall C with me. Uh, I hope to see you in person at a future open house. What an exciting place to work, Brad. Thank you for walking us through Hall C. I now want to take about five minutes to go through some questions from our viewers. 
On the first question, how do you control the spin of a neutron? The spin of a neutron. That's actually pretty tricky. Uh, the way we do it is we have to, there's no free neutron target. So we have to uh, take advantage of nuclei with special properties. And in our hall, we use uh, helium-3. One of the cool things about helium-3 is that it's got two, pro, uh, two neutrons, rather. Uh, it's got two protons and one neutron. And we can polarize that nucleus so that combination of the two protons and the neutron in a particular direction using magnetic fields and lasers and a few other techniques. Uh, because the two protons are in there, they tend to line up with their spins anti-aligned. One's going in one direction, one's going in the other direction. So the interaction of the electrons or the photon, whatever it is we're trying to use to probe what's going on inside that nucleus or the nucleons inside that polarized helium-3, uh, they, if we can polarize that entire nucleus, then it is the same as, or roughly the same as polarizing that neutron. So uh, the interactions with the proton tend to cancel out for the things that we're trying to measure, which allows us to really focus in on just the polarized neutron. And that polarized neutron is pointing in the direction that we're able to polarize that entire helium-3 nucleus. There are a few other ways to do it with very, very strong magnetic fields that allow us to sanity check and cross-check the measurements that we make on the polarized helium-3. But that's what we've been using recently. Great. Thanks, Brad. Um, what do you do with the unused beam in the dump? Oh, yeah. Uh, so that's kind of an interesting thing. We go through, uh, I think I mentioned in the video, all this effort, an accelerator goes through all this effort to get those electrons all with exactly the same energy lined up and moving in exactly the same direction. We take the spin of the electron and we and the accelerator can point it in whatever direction we, the experimentalists, would like it to point in. And then, you know, a ridiculously small fraction of that total electron energy, the, the electrons going in the, down that beam line, actually interact with a target and are useful to us. So, all the rest goes down. We don't want to see what happens to it because it hasn't hit our target, so we're not interested. Uh, we don't want it to blur our measurement. So it goes down into uh, what we call the beam dump region, which is a hole at the back of the accelerator, or back at the experimental hall, into what is essentially a giant tub of water. And uh, when it goes through that tub of water, it interacts with all the water molecules and energy gets converted to heat. Then we then pump away. So we can take a megawatt of beam in the hall and maybe, you know, a few tenths of a percent of that actually interact and are useful for the experiment. And 99.9% .9 of that beam energy just goes up to heating up a big tub of water at the end of the day. And it's all buried underground so none of the radiation can get out and all the energy goes into just heat, which is easy to dispose of. Great, thank you. Um, so another question, you mentioned a sister hall. Which one is that, and how is it different from Hall C? Yeah, all right, so uh, a sister hall is, is Hall A. So we're in Hall C, and there's halls A, B, C, and D. Uh, hall A is very much like Hall C. It has two large detector apparatuses called uh, spectrometers um, in its natural configuration. Uh, and those spectrometers are free to move about the hall. They're able to rotate or pivot about the target direction in very much in the same way that uh, the two spectrometers in Hall C are able to do, like I discussed in the video. Uh, what we can also do now in Hall A is uh, the older spectrometers, actually what we're doing right now in Hall A is the older spectrometers have been moved, they've been rotated out of the way, and two new customized devices are put into, that, into the experimental hall. Uh, those devices can also move around so that we can measure, fine-tune our detector apparatus uh, to really measure exactly what we want when we, we hit our target, our protons or our neutrons, with the electron beam. So we're calling it, or it's basically turning into what we refer to as a large installation hall, where we can really customize the detector equipment um, to do things that the standard equipment, like the spectrometers in Hall C, the SHMS and HMS, and class 12 um, in Hall B and the, the Gluex spectrometer in Hall Delta aren't really capable of doing. It, they just do other things. It's all very complementary. 
Okay, great. And the last question we have time for, Brad, um, what types of targets do you use for experiments? Oh, so a whole variety of targets. Um, one, of the, one of the targets that we use really all the time because it's very standard, so we can use it to sanity check um, that we understand our detector calibrations, things like that, are carbon foils. They're just thin sheets of black carbon, same kind of material that you have inside your mechanical pencil. Uh, we also use things like aluminum or uh, gold. We've used uh, tungsten, very, very heavy metal. Um, like I mentioned, we use gaseous targets like helium, uh, cryogenic targets, uh, hydrogen, um, deuterium, other materials that we cool down so much that they convert from a gas into a liquid. Uh, it really depends what we're trying to measure. Okay, thank you so much, Brad. Now that, you have visited, now that you have visited our main accelerator and several of our experiments, it's time to bring you to our research and development operation with Anne Marie, an SRF R&D physicist with the SRF Institute. Jefferson Lab is a world leader in superconducting radio frequency, or SRF, accelerator technology and capabilities. In fact, Jefferson Lab was the first facility to successfully implement a large-scale application of SRF accelerating technology in the Continuous Electron Beam Accelerator Facility, or CBAF. Particle accelerators built with SRF technology deliver a continuous beam of particles with improved beam quality and lower energy consumption. SRF acceleration capability begins with a metal called niobium. When cooled to temperatures near absolute zero, Large amounts of energy can be transmitted through niobium with very little loss to resistance or heat. A string of eight hollow niobium components, called accelerator cavities, are housed in a 6-ton, 30-foot-long individual section of particle accelerator called a cryomodule. Nearly 12,000 individual pieces are used to build each cryomodule, which insulates the cavities, allowing them to remain cold and superconducting. Jefferson Labs SRF Institute pioneers SRF research and development. Staff build and test one-of-a-kind components and also assemble, refurbish, and test particle accelerators for research worldwide. Welcome to the SRF Institute. My name is Anne-Marie Valente Feliciano. I'm a researcher here at Jefferson Lab. The SRF Institute is uh, constituted of uh, scientists, engineers, technicians. We also host postdoctoral scientists and PhD students. At the SRF Institute, we design, prototype, and assemble the basic units of an accelerator, which are called uh, SRF uh, cavities, and we assemble them in cryo units called the cryo modules. Superconducting RF technology aims at accelerating particles in accelerators such as electrons, protons, and neutrons. The superconducting RF technology is based on the use of superconducting materials such as niobium. The particularity of uh, these materials is that below their transition temperature, their electrical resistance becomes very small, almost null. The RF response of these accelerating structures is extremely sensitive to the inner top surface of the structure. So this means that the processing of uh, such structures is extremely critical. The material that we use as sheet material, such as this one, it then needs to be shaped and welded together to form a structure such as the one that's behind me. Once the structure is completed, we have to remove every defect and particles that could be residing on the surface. For this, we do process the cavity with mechanical polishing and chemical etching. Because we need to uh, take care to have no particulates on the surface, most of these processes are taking place into a clean room, such as the one behind me. Near-term research projects, we aim at improving the quality of bulk niobium and its response to RF. For this, we are injecting a little quantity of nitrogen into the surface in a furnace, or we are playing with the oxide, natural oxide layer of the material in order to increase 
its efficiency and its response to, uh, to the radio frequency. For midterm and long-term um, research projects, we aim at developing surfaces that are based on niobium, but are using niobium as a thin layer on a copper substrate, or by developing alternative materials such as niobium 3 tin or naive titanium nitride in multi-layer to have a uh, transition temperature that is much higher than, uh, than bulk naive. Now we're going to leave the cleanroom area and go to our electron beam welding facility where cavity parts or pieces are stitched together in an electron beam welder to form a complete RF cavity structure. We are now in our electron beam uh, welding facility once the uh, naive material is uh, machined and deep drawn into half cell, the uh, different uh, parts of the cavities are welded together in our in the vacuum chamber that is behind me, where an electron beam is going to fuse the material, melt the material together, to um, you know at different places in the uh, at the cavity here at the iris where the electrical fields are the highest uh, when excited with uh, radio frequency or at the, also at the equator where the magnetic field is the highest. I, we, once we have uh, the cavity that is completed, such as the one that is next to me here, the cavity proceeds to chemistry in order to have all defects of the materials removed and then it will go into the clean room where it's going to be uh, cleanly assembled into two different things. So whether the cavity is going to be uh, tested in our vertical uh, test facility in order to see if it meets the specification and it has the efficiency that we were looking for, or it's going to be put, it, it will be put together with other cavities as a cavity string will, that will be inserted in the cryo module. Uh, that this cryo module will be tested in our cryo module testing facility in order to assess its performance before it goes down to the accelerator tunnel. Now we're going to proceed to our research and development labs where we are uh, developing alternative uh, uh, technologies for uh, superconducting uh, RF uh, surfaces such as the deposition of niobium on copper substrates and the development of alternative superconductors such as niobium 3 tin and multi-layers based on niobium titanium nitride. Superconducting RF technologies are multidisciplinary field that encompasses different aspects. There is the RF design to develop uh, innovative schemes of RF acceleration that includes simulations and calculations. The processing of our surfaces to improve on the base material, which is bulk niobium, or to create innovative surfaces of such as niobium on copper and multi-layers based on niobium titanium nitride or niobium 3 tin in order for the uh, base material, bulk niobium, to be able to sustain much higher field than it can on its own. Here we have a twin axis niobium cavity that has been coated on uh, the inside with niobium sweetened in our tin diffusion furnace. And here we do have a niobium on copper cavity that has been deposited with high power impulse magnetron sputtering with the system that's behind me. I hope that I um, helped you to get a field of uh, the activities that we have here at the SRF Institute. And I thank you for joining me today. We now have Anne-Marie here for our live Q&A. Anne-Marie, thank you for joining us today. In the interest of time, let's just jump right into some questions about your amazing research. What can, what can particle accelerators be used for beyond fundamental science? Well, Lauren, actually they can be used in a wide range of needs uh, for both society and industry, for example, it can be used for in medicine, for cancer treatments, medical isotopes, production, the sterilization of medical instruments. They can be used in uh, wastewater treatment for sterilization, preserv preservation, uh, modification of material properties for chemistry. They can also be used in national security for scanning of uh, incoming cargo and uh, accelerator driven systems. So energy plants uh, can be operated in a more safe and uh, efficient way. And this is actually, uh, these, these applications are actually the motivation behind some of our research is aimed at making uh, accelerator more efficient, more powerful in a smaller footprint and cheaper. Wonderful. Uh, so what was your field of study to become an SRF physicist? 
Well, I studied condensed matter physics. Uh, I became fascinated in, um, in physics, by physics, uh, in high school. And uh, that fascination continued when I got the opportunity to have uh, some um, internships uh, in research labs uh, at university during my curriculum um, at the university in France. And actually, I was exposed to superconducting RFs in film technology uh, during a fellowship at CERN. And um, uh, for those that are interested in the field of SRF, I would encourage them to seek mentorship or um, internship in one of the many DOE um, lab programs that are um, available, as well as in some universities uh, that are at every level from high school all the way and uh, going through undergraduate and, and graduate programs. Thank you, Amory. Um, can you tell us why do the accelerator cavity structures have different shapes? So uh, they, the, uh, the, the cavities are different uh, shape because they are a core um, element of the superconducting accelerator as they are used to increase the particle uh, velocity of, um, you know, uh, it through in the beam. So in the, um, actually in the case of linear accelerator, accelerator they're actually the dominant uh, component of the, uh, of the machine. Uh, since there are different types of accelerator, the RF cavities have been optimized uh, with different uh, properties and for different purposes, depending on um, their shape and their size is going to depend on their function Function in the machine. Uh, are they uh, aimed at the acceleration of the beam, at the deflection of the beam, um, or at the combination for, um, you know, deflection or combination, or uh, to confine the particle uh, bunches during the beam transport. So, um, other factors that are at play are going to be uh, the mode uh, employed for acceleration, the nature of the particle that's accelerated, uh, the uh, specific parameter for the machine, such as the total required energy, uh, and the type of science and conductivity that we use. So, uh, these, these, each cavity uh, is um, uh, targeted for, for specific use and uh, for certain specifications in the machine. And sometimes, uh, actually, often in, in a machine, you have several types and several shapes of cavities. Okay, great. And you mentioned niobium as a super superconducting material. What other materials can be used for superconductor applications? Well, there are thousands of superconductors actually uh, out there, but uh, to name a few, especially that are useful for um, SRF uh, applications, we have uh, compounds of niobium, such as niobium titanium nitride, niobium uh, nitride, um, niobium 310. We have a more recent um, discovered uh, superconductor, such as MGB2. And you have also other classes of, um, of, of material new, that, are, be, that have been discovered, you know, more recently, such as the 2D superconductors, such uh, that are, for example, um, iron selenide, and you also have, uh, you know, um, another class of material is called the metamaterials. It's basically the combination of several materials to collecting and insulating in very, very thin layer in order to modify the properties of the base material. Okay, and it looks like the last question I have for you today was from our live chat. Is niobium better than copper? Uh, for... <laughs> <laughs> That's a very excellent question. Uh, well, uh, for accelerators, uh, niobium allows us to, um, you know, because it's a superconductor, it allows us to operate a machine uh, at very low temperature, um, but continuously, such as, uh, you know, for CBAF, right? We have we are, have um, a continuous uh, wave um, machine. So that means that we need to have uh, cavities that are able to sustain the power um, continuously without turning the, the, the machine off. Well, in this case, niobium is better than just bare copper. But I will argue that niobium on copper, which is a mix of the two, uh, can be equally um, as, uh, as good. Well, thank you, Amory. Um, and now last, but certainly not least, we take you on a tour with Jonathan, our head of cryogenics, to explore the two largest cryogenic refrigerators on the planet. Cryogenic refrigeration is key to many of the technologies that enable research at Jefferson Lab. The lab's three particle accelerators have components that must be cryogenically cooled to operate efficiently. These components include superconducting accelerator structures, magnets, unique targets, 
and accelerator component testing facilities. In all, Jefferson Lab has five major cryogenic refrigerators on site. Two of these are the largest single 2 Kelvin refrigerators in the world. Jefferson Lab's two central helium liquefiers together chill more than 30,000 gallons of liquid helium by compressing warm helium gas to high pressures and then sending it through cold boxes. The cold boxes usher the helium through a sophisticated system of tiny turbine expanders, each spinning thousands of times per second, followed by a set of complex heat exchangers. The system removes energy from the helium and reduces its pressure until it becomes a superfluid, which flows without resistance and conducts heat freely. The central helium liquefiers work together to cool particle accelerator components in CBAF and the low energy recirculator facility to their operating temperature of 2 Kelvin, or minus 456 degrees Fahrenheit, just a few degrees above absolute zero. Jefferson Labs cryogenics personnel design, build, operate, and maintain the lab's cryogenic refrigeration facilities and have provided their expertise to research facilities in the United States and around the world. Hello, I'm Jonathan Creel. I'm head of the cryogenics department here at Thomas Jefferson National Accelerator Facility. Our group is about 50 people, including engineers, technicians, welders, and pipe fitters, and our mission is to design, build, and operate some of the largest helium refrigerators in the country. Those refrigerators produce temperatures down to negative 456 degrees Fahrenheit. In order to do that, we have to get ultra pure helium, which has no contamination in it, because any contamination in the helium will be a solid at the temperatures that we operate at. So the first thing we do is take the ultra pure helium into some large compressors. The compressors have horsepower ranges of 800 to 2500 horsepower, and they consume approximately five megawatts of electric power or about the amount of power it takes to power 5,000 homes. The compressors compress the gas up to very high pressures so that we can use it in the refrigeration equipment. Behind me, you see the first stage of that refrigeration equipment where the helium is changed in temperature from room temperature or about 70 degrees Fahrenheit down to about liquid nitrogen temperature, which is around negative 320 degrees Fahrenheit. Once the helium is at minus 320 degrees Fahrenheit, we're going to move it to the four and a half Kelvin refrigerator, which we're gonna go see now. This is the main four and a half Kelvin refrigeration room. This is where the helium comes from the outside pre-cooler unit. It enters through the large transfer line system you see above me on the wall. When it comes into this refrigeration unit, it gets cooled down to lower and lower temperatures using the equipment that we're gonna go up on top and see now. Now we're on top of the four and a half Kelvin refrigerator. This contains valves that control the flow of helium around the heat exchangers that are inside of this box below me. They also control the flow of helium into turbo expanders like these here. These turbo expanders take in high pressure helium and they spin a turbine wheel that expands the gas and lowers its pressure and its temperature. This is a cryogenic expansion turbine. It takes in the high pressure helium and forces a turbine wheel to spin at speeds of up to 250,000 revolutions per minute. It doesn't have mechanical bearings. It uses a gas stream around the shaft to hold it up and allow it to spin at these incredible speeds. Energy basically gets transferred from this side of the turbine to this side. The gas on this side gets colder and the gas on this side gets warmer where it's cooled in this water jacket which sends the energy out to our cooling towers. Next, we're gonna go to the two Kelvin machine which is the last part of the refrigeration process. Now we're on top of the two Kelvin refrigerator. Normal helium at one atmosphere is 4.5 Kelvin. If you wanna go colder, you have to lower the pressure. This machine lowers the pressure from one atmosphere 
to 0 0.039 atmospheres, which is 2.08 Kelvin. This machine does this using these five cold compressors, which spins at speeds of up to 50,000 RPM, and they draw a vacuum on the helium that lowers its pressure. The 2.08 Kelvin helium is then used to cool components which are in the main accelerator. The next stop is going to be our control room where we control these refrigerators. This is the cryogenic control room where we change the operations of our cryogenic plants. The engineers behind me are using computers and programmable logic controllers to change the operational modes of the plants and to direct where the cryogens are flowing to the various loads on site. Thank you for your time. I appreciate it. Wow, Jonathan, really cool stuff. I have several questions from you from our viewers as time allows. First one is, why do you use helium? Uh, that's a great question. We use helium as a refrigerant because it's the only substance known to man that's not a solid at the temperatures we operate at. And so we can't use things like freon or carbon dioxide or other things that you may have heard of that are used in some refrigeration system. Awesome. And where does helium come from? So helium, interestingly enough, comes out of the ground. Um, when they're taking natural gas out of the ground and processing it for use as a fuel, a very small percentage of that natural gas is helium. And so they will set up helium reclamation units at natural gas facilities and they'll slipstream that gas off and then uh, take it out and, uh, and put it into a liquid form where they uh, deliver it to storage facilities that we buy from. So where does the heat go when you cool things down? That's a good question too. So basically, like other things here at the Accelerator that y'all have heard about, um, the, the series of steps that we do for refrigeration are basically to um, move heat from the things that we're trying to cool to things that we don't care about if they get warm. And so in our system, we move heat from the things we're trying to cool through the refrigerator all the way out to the cooling towers where the big, huge cooling towers cool the uh, cool water with uh, cool things down with water and big fans. And so we're moving that temperature or that heat through that environment and expelling it to the outside atmosphere. So how much electricity does it take to cool something down to two Kelvin then? So that's a good question too. So again, we have five refrigerators on site. Two of them are, are these very large two Kelvin machines. And each one of those two Kelvin machines draws about five megawatts of power on average. And if you think about it, that's about how much power it takes to operate 5,000 houses. And if another unit of measure would be to say each watt of cooling that you need at two Kelvin costs you Oh, around, you know, 600 watts to 1,000 watts of utility power, depending on how you're doing the refrigeration cycle. Can you tell me, are the cold, are the extreme cold temperatures dangerous? Yes, so uh, we have to be very careful in doing the work that we do around site, because yes, the, uh, the temperatures, you're down at, you know, 320 below zero, 450 below zero, and so that if your skin gets exposed to that, it can cause instant frostbite and it can damage your, your skin tissues pretty, pretty quickly. And so we're very careful. We train people very carefully. We uh, make sure people are very competent and we make sure that we're wearing the appropriate safety gear whenever we go out to do anything. And we will sit down and we'll plan out actions very carefully so that we make sure we minimize our risk. Okay. And, um, why do things need to be cold? Well, like you've heard from some of the other experts uh, on their various systems, here at Jefferson Lab, in order to make the accelerator operate the way that it needs to, we have to be able to uh, take the uh, niobium cavities and other metals down to superconducting temperatures. In order to get them down to superconducting temperatures, we have to use these large refrigeration systems to get them down to 450 or 456 below zero. And so basically, we use these large refrigeration systems in order to help the uh, accelerator be able to do its job and accelerate the electrons. 
Great, thank you, Jonathan. And one last question I have for you today. Um, do you have operators on shift all the time while the cryogenic systems are online? Well, that's a good question too. So basically we design our systems so that they're for the most part computer controlled. And so we don't have operators that are sitting in our, uh, in our control rooms 24 hours a day, seven days a week while the accelerator is running. The computers that we've programmed know what the operational envelopes of the uh, cryogenics equipment are. And if the cryogenics equipment deviates from its normal operating conditions, it will set alarms that then get operators called in where they can diagnose and, and change the behavior of the machine or call in people to help repair things. Our equipment is programmed basically so that as the load of the accelerator changes, our refrigeration units will automatically follow that load so that we're always providing what's needed to cool the accelerator, but not more than that, so that we're not wasting electricity, we're not wasting liquid nitrogen and other power, um, you know, valuable resources. Well, thank you so much, Jonathan. And thank you to all our viewers for sticking with us through the live stream and the technical glitches that we experienced. After this broadcast, we will post a full version of the live event on our YouTube channel. Also, you can visit the event webpage at jlab.org slash VFT 2021 for additional resources for teachers that would like to use this for future lesson planning, as well as some great student activities. Now let's check back with our lab director for some final thoughts. Stuart, back to you. Thanks, Lauren. I hope you've enjoyed this field trip to Jefferson Lab. You've seen a truly unique scientific facility firsthand and got to hear directly from some of our scientists and engineers about Jefferson Lab and the exciting work that we do here. On behalf of our dedicated staff and the teams of scientists who make use of our world-leading facility, we're proud of the science that we accomplish here, and we're very happy that you've joined us to learn more about Virginia's National Lab. Thanks so much for your time, and thanks for visiting.